All right, everybody. Well, it's so good to have all of you joining us. Uh, we have a live studio audience here today, and we also have uh, Facebook Live as well. And so if you're on Zoom and you want a little bit cleaner sound, go to Facebook Live and join us there. But anyway, I'm so excited about this day. I get to be with one of the you know amazing leaders that's been such a mentor in my life and has had such an impact in my life. Uh, but before I introduce Bill... I just want to say this is the beginning of a series that we are doing called Apostolic Voices. And this Apostolic Voices Masterclass is focused on trying to help the church to understand how to integrate the different gifts of the Spirit, particularly the apostolic and prophetic gifts, into how we do church in the, in the real world. And so we have different speakers coming from different perspectives. And uh, as I begin, though, I'd like to just give a, a little disclaimer, because our audience right now, we probably have about 300 people online. And let me just say that, you know, we love the whole body of Christ. Christ. But there are different perspectives around the church, especially as it relates to the question of the apostolic. Yes. And so, you know, first of all, let me just say clearly that when we talk about apostolic, we are talking about the Ephesians 4 gifting, but we're not talking about the replacements for the 12 apostles of the Lamb right. <laughs> that we uh, affirm, all, you know, Jesus' choice in that. The second thing we're not talking about is we're not talking about anyone writing new scripture. Okay, so please hear that clearly. And then the final issue that I really want to make sure we underscore is that there's a lot of teaching about the apostolic right now, and some of it's very focused on uh, dominionism. And obviously, you know, we believe that Jesus is going to come and set up his kingdom, but, you know, we also believe that we are to be salt and light, so that we're not supposed to be the dominating force in society. We are supposed to influence through our servanthood, through our love. And so, again, if we can clarify those three things... I'd like to introduce Bill Johnson. So thank you, Bill, for being with us. You know, you need no introduction, but I just want to say that I first met you about 15 years ago, and uh, we moved up here after 33 years of pastoring in San Francisco. We moved up about 10 years ago, and it's just been such an honor to be connected to you and what God's doing here. So, you know, as we begin, I just like your perspective. What do you see as apostolic ministry? What does it mean? How, how does it manifest in the local church? Just give us your thoughts as we get started. Well, um, the apostolic has several layers to it. One is it's uh, a culturizing agent. It, uh, it really catches a perspective of the reality of heaven, how heaven functions, mm. uh, the values of God's world and what it looks like to implement those here. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, the transformational role. Yeah. Uh, there's also the power role. Mm. They really help to set a standard of, uh, of power, uh, not just focused on apostles doing all the stuff, right. but uh, really training up raising people. And, and when you have the apostolic in place, there tends to be a greater dimension of power for miracles and for endurance. Uh, both, both are essential parts of a uh, display of God's power. So tell us, like, you know, looking through history, looking through scripture, what are some of the models that you see that, you know, of apostolic ministry that mean the most to you? Oh, goodness. Well, of course, in Scripture, the entire book of Acts, you know, yeah. you, you can't beat that. Exactly. Um, a, a personal favorite, uh, a guy that you hardly ever hear of, uh, is a guy named Hans Nelson Hauge mm -hmm. in Norway. Yeah. He, was, uh, he was a revivalist. A reformer that was in prison for preaching, mm. but he, he had this he had this unusual gift as a revivalist of transforming culture by starting businesses, and he was actually in prison one time for preaching the gospel. They pulled him out of prison because the the nation was in the health crisis because of the lack of salt. And they knew he would know how to fix that. And so they brought him out of prison. He created a salt factory. And it really saved the nation in many ways. And, uh, and then they put him back in prison, which is absolute crazy. But, uh, but he, was a, he was a culturizer in that he would, he would go into a city or a village and preach the gospel. People would come to Christ. He would see the young people there that needed uh, a 
purpose other than farming or whatever it is that they may have been doing previous. And he'd start a business and turn it over to them. So he, wow. it's a most unusual gift, but, yeah. I, but I admire so much. And then, of course, the reformers of uh, uh, Calvin and all those guys, you know, uh, sure. way back in Geneva, back in those days. Um, I admire all of that because they, they, uh, they were revivalists on one hand, but they also transformed the world they're in. Yeah, I, that's just, those are my, my favorite yeah, stories. Yeah. Now, when we, you know, one of the classic messages here is on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And that whole idea of kingdom come, will be done, um, how does that intersect with the apostolic role? Like, how do you see those, that message and the apostolic function kind of working together? Well, I, personally, I think the entire what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught in Matthew 6, taught his disciples, that that really is an apostolic prayer because the apostolic role is to bring the reality of that world into this one. Yes. And so that prayer is under, in my perspective, is under the mandate of apostolic influence. And so the, the church prays it, prays the concepts in the prayer, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done, your kingdom, the king's domain, the reality of your rule, the lordship of Jesus, let it become manifest in the, in the specifics of everyday life. It may be in my health, it may be in my thinking, it may be in business, it may be in family, but the point is, is the reality of his lordship, the reality of his rule as the benevolent king that he is, becomes manifest, realized, and measurable. Wow. And that's, that's the prayer. And then wow. Jesus, of course, taught the areas that were important to pray for, the provision, the whole issues of forgiveness, and, and all of that. But it was all in the context of transformation. That's right. Wow, that's such, such amazing thought. So kind of getting down to the essence of the gospel of the kingdom, I'd like you to just maybe take a few minutes and unpack that for us. Like, what is the gospel of the kingdom? How do, you know, how do we see it manifest in the life of Jesus? How do we see it then carried on by the apostles? Like, what was actually being taught there? Um, you know, the nature of Christ, what he did, how he did it, and how he empowered us to continue his ministry. All those aspects. Give us some thoughts on that. Jesus, uh, in, in Matthew 12, 28, he said... If I cast a demon out of you by the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. then the kingdom of God came upon you. Yeah. And so what he, what he did there is he described a condition that got reversed, and then he describes how it happened. It's because the reality of the kingdom, the present tense reality of God's dominion, mm -hmm. came crashing into where the enemy once ruled. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's the conflict mm -hmm. of kingdoms. Yeah. And our role is to give opportunity for the extravagant one, which is the Father, to show up and do what only he can do. And that's to heal, heal people's bodies, restore their minds, heal marriages, give, uh, set them on track to uh, fulfill their purpose in life, whether it's through business or education, whatever it might be. But the whole point is, is the kingdom of God is very practical mm -hmm. and it's, it has to be measurable. Mm -hmm. We can't just pray broad random prayers, your kingdom come, and not be able to measure. Because if, if, if the kingdom comes, his lordship is realized, then it's going to affect our relationship. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect how we value each other. Yes. It's going to affect the way I treat my wife, my children, my grandchildren. Right. It's going to affect the way I view the course of history. It's going to affect the way I look at infirmity. Yes. All those things are targets for his sovereign rule. Yeah. And he's already told us what he wanted. You know, he's already said, as it is in heaven. So that's the mandate we live under. But it, it, needs, to be, it needs to be measurable, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you have that person uh, that's been under torment, Matthew uh, 12, 28, right. a person that's been s suffering under the torment of the enemy, that Jesus comes along or you come along in his name and pray for him. There's freedom. And I just, I just love the fact that Jesus described this is how it happened. Darkness ruled, light came, darkness is gone. And that's the concept. Amen.